whether it's your millionth time being with us or whether it's your first time or somewhere in between. Um, it, it feels like I've had a special birthday up here this morning. There's all sorts of thank you cards flying around, so I'll, I'll mention some of them. But the big news, if you have not heard this week, is the safe delivery of Harry David Hogarth weighing in at a healthy seven pound six ounces born on the 9th of October to Sam and Olivia. Yes, which is amazing news. So we look forward to welcoming him in his first time at Hope Church. There have been a variety of different celebrations going on at the other end of the spectrum. Ooh. Thank you. Yeah, it's all right, it's all right there, Tony. So one of which was John Merrini had a significant birthday with a zero at the end of it. And I was, not two zeros at the end of it, no, not quite. I was, I was shocked by the number at the beginning of it, 90. So congratulations, achieving that milestone on the 11th of October. And he sent us a card to all my brothers and sisters at Hope Church. Thank you for all, all very much for your cards and wishes on my 90th birthday. In God's love, John Merrini. I'm not 90, just 18 with 72 years experience. <laughs> uh, another thank you card from Lillian and Dave as they celebrated their golden wedding. Many, many thanks for all your good wishes, cards and prayers to celebrate our golden wedding. The flowers and vase were greatly appreciated. God bless you all and thank you. And one more, and this was on a 60th wedding anniversary. Um, Tony and Dorothy, on the occasion of our 60th year together, your kindness is appreciated more than you could ever know. Thank you, Lord, for surrounding us with people who are who we are blessed to know as brothers and sisters in Christ. So, bless all of you on your special days. Thank you. I think we're through the cards. Usual activities are on this week. If you don't know what those usual activities are, I'd suggest consulting our website or signing up to Hope Church News email updates, or even better, talking to someone over a cup of tea after the service. But one thing that is on this week that I've been asked to mention is the coffee morning returns on Thursday morning. It has a starting time, 10 o'clock. Whether it has an end time is another matter entirely. Um, shoebox appeal. Christmas, as much as I hate to say it, is rushing upon us. I know it's still October. The shoebox appeal. Kelly, wave at us, please. So Kelly is just here if you're wanting boxes or information. But even better, why not come to church tonight at 6 o'clock? Because we've got a representative from Blytheswood Care, who we send the shoeboxes um, via, coming to talk to us. So we've got Jean Lee from that organisation with us this evening to tell us a little more about why we do these shoe boxes and where they will go. Think. It's okay, usual activities. Talk to somebody about it. There you go. Apparently there's a knitting club on as well. No, it's part of the circle of hope. Apparently you can take your knitting if you, if you want to, but you don't have to knit to go. You just have to be female. Okay, let's get stuck into the Bible this morning. Before I get in trouble, um, I'd like you to turn, if you will, with me, find Proverbs. It's roughly at the centre of your pew Bibles. If you've got one that looks like this, one of the old, older ones, it's uh, on page 637. If it doesn't look like this, all I can say is if you hit Psalms, keep going to the right. If you hit any of the prophets or Ecclesiastes or anything like that, start going left. And hopefully you'll meet us somewhere 
in the third chapter of Proverbs. So the last few weeks, if you've not been with us, we've been looking at some of the ancient wisdom to be found in the book of Proverbs, and we're looking at chapter 3, going from verse 13 down to verse 18, which will give us a hint as to our theme for this morning. Proverbs 3, verse 13. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom. The man who gains understanding. For she, and that is wisdom personified, is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. and In her left are riches and honour. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. So we're here to seek wisdom, not the wisdom that the world offers, but wisdom from God this morning. So we need his help, so we'll pray together. Almighty God, we are a privileged people in so many ways. And we ask for your help this morning as we consider your ancient wisdom to apply it to our modern lives, to live well in your world. We ask you to accept our worship this morning, meet with us by your spirit and change us so we become more like Jesus as a result. Amen. Amen. I wonder how you are feeling singing some of those statements at the end there, declaring that forever God is faithful, forever God is strong and and his love endures forever. And sometimes our feelings can be up and down just like the British weather. And if it's raining in the morning, we feel a bit rubbish and can feel a million miles away from God. And then when the sun comes out, we just feel that little bit better. Which is why we're trying to build our lives on the authority of the word of God and what is true. Because our feelings are so changeable. But God and his character in the way he is for us, it's his settled direction towards us, Lord. And it's just phenomenal that whatever changes and whatever circumstances you bring with you this morning, that he is just as real in the darkness as he is in the light. What a God we serve. Our attention is shifting to the topic of money this morning. I know, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we all have that kind of response to it. And an advert, and I normally never watch adverts. I try and avoid adverts like the plague. But one advert has stuck in my mind. So well done to Barclays for uh, doing this particular advert. Now if you could switch to my laptop, gentlemen, please. I'm going to come out of that and... We're going to watch. Now, other banks are available. Hope Church is in no way advocating giving your money to Barclays. But have a watch of this short advert because it tells us something important about when our relationship with money begins to be formed. And see if some of you are the, at the same age as they suggest. Dog needs walking. Lights. I have a light too, Bill. You tell anyone. I want it, so try it. Who had the calamari? It was for the table. I didn't touch it. You had like five pieces. I'm allergic to shellfish. I'd be in hospital if I ate it. Is that what you want, Mila? Me in the hospital? I'm thinking. Are what you kidding what me? What she asked you? Why would you ask her? Ah, that's for crumpet, sweetheart. Ah, is it? The eyes are the first to go. These are all original mouldings. Oh, lovely. And here's the dining area. You think after 30 years I, I'd be prepared for this? <laughs> but, but I'm not. 
No, seriously, I really should have saved more. Or, or anything, really. Anyway, two divorces later, here I am. Happy retirement, me. Happy retirement. Studies show our relationship with money is formed from the age of seven. So I hear that you want to talk about To start a new one, whatever your age, talk to us today. Thanks. You're welcome. Barclays. Make money work for you. So put your hand up if you are seven years old. Have we got any seven-year-olds? Have we got any eight-year-olds? Oh, we've got seven-year-olds. We've got seven, seven-year-olds at the back. Have we got any six-year-olds? No. Eight-year-olds? We've got an eight-year-old. Okay. Oh, re- down there. Thank you, Rebecca. So this advert is suggesting, based on the studies that have been done, that your relationship with money begins when you're about seven years old. And who do you think gives you your ideas of how to treat money? Flick to the the adults in the room. Parents who might be a little bit closed off with their money. Grandparents who seem to be able to make it rain money at times. So every single person in here has a responsibility to have a good relationship with their money. Now, um, spoiler alert this morning, we're talking about money, and the kids are going to go downstairs and talk about money, but if you are not a regular attender of church or not a member of church and this is your first time, please be assured I won't be asking you for money this morning. (laughs) I'm going to look at what the Bible has to say about it. Um, I'm going to turn to the wisdom of Paul just to give you a couple of um, ideas from his life, because he is a guy, you can turn to it if you wish, I'm going to be skipping around um, Philippians chapter 4, so I'm not going to be reading every single verse that's on here, so sorry to those who are at the back, I'd advise you, go home and read the whole of Philippians, but particularly chapter 4, it's talking about money, and we're going from verse it's right towards the end of the Bible and if you're in a few Bibles it's on 1181 and Paul's command to the people he is writing to the church at Philippi is this rejoice in the Lord always I will say it again rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near do not be anxious about everything uh, anything But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now if you flick down to halfway through verse 11. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He's talking about Jesus there. Then flick down to verse 19. What a promise this is. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. No wonder he finishes by saying to God, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Some interesting principles there. Talking about anxiety versus thankfulness, craving versus contentedness, and stinginess versus generosity. We're going to be digging into all those kinds of things through the lens of the book of Proverbs this morning. But we need to pray. Let's let's just pray about those particular things before we sing one more time. Our Father, for those who know what it is to struggle with money and worry about money and bills and circumstances and employment, we pray for them this morning, that they would find their contentedness in you, 
and support from other people within the fellowship. We pray that you would help us have a wise relationship with our money and our possessions. Help us to model contentedness to our children, our grandchildren, our relations. Help us to be a people known by love in the area of our finances. Because we ask this in the name of the one who was rich, yet for our sake became poor, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Michael wasn't aware of this, and I wasn't aware of this. I didn't even know he was planning a series on Proverbs. And I just happened to be reading through the book of Proverbs in my own personal devotions at the moment. And I'd like you to turn, if you will, there might be a bit of flicking around this morning. If you could turn to Proverbs 28... Now, on this occasion, I'm not going to tell you a page because I'm going to read you what I was reading this week. So it might be slightly different words. I'm currently using um, a Christian Standard Bible, which was a, a new translation that was done in 2017, revised again in 2020. And it tries to strike this balance between being faithful to the original text, but also helping us understand what the Word of God has to say in 2024. I think it finds this really helpful pathway between. So I'm going to read a selection of verses because I was struck, bear in mind this was just my reading yesterday, I was struck with how many times money came up. And that just was not planned, certainly not planned by me at any rate. Obviously the Lord knew what he was doing. So Proverbs 28, if you look at Verse 6, better the poor person who lives with integrity than the rich one who distorts right and wrong. Verse 8, whoever increases his wealth through excessive interest collects it for one who is kind to the poor. Verse 11, a rich person is wise in his own eyes, but a poor one who has discernment sees through him. Verse 19, the one who works his land will have plenty of food, but whoever chases fantasies will have his fill of poverty. Verse 20, a faithful person will have many blessings, but one in a hurry to get rich will not go unpunished. Verse 22, a greedy one is in a hurry for wealth. He doesn't know that poverty will come to him. Verse 25, a greedy person stirs up conflict, but whoever trusts in the Lord will prosper. And verse 27, the one who gives to the poor will not be in need. The one who turns his eyes away will receive many curses. I'm just struck by how many times these themes of money and wealth were coming up in this book of wisdom. So we're going to be looking at God's everyday wisdom about money. Now let's get this bit out of the way. Talking about money... Certainly, I can find it incredibly awkward, particularly when it comes to a time when you've been out for a meal with friends and you have the awkward moment of splitting the bill. And you saw it in that clip earlier, but they had a starter. I only had a tap water. We shared a dessert. And that's when you discover the true character of the people you are hanging out with. And in every group, there is a big spender and a Scrooge and everything in between. I wonder who you most identify with, the big spender or the Scrooge. <laughs> and I wonder what your friends would say if I asked them. We could have a reputation that precedes us in terms of the way we speak about money and the way we act around money. When it comes to talking about money in a church setting... I would say it's probably less difficult for me to speak about it than it would be for Michael or Sam because I don't have to persuade you to review your giving because it has no impact on my salary. The government pays my salary. Why are we talking about it at all then? I would argue talking about money is necessary. And where do I get that from? I get it from this book, the Bible. Money's mentioned 140 times in the pages of Scripture, 
But when you look at other words linked to it, like gold and silver and riches and wealth, that number goes up to 2,350 times. It seems like the Lord wants us to have a lot of instruction about this area of money. So, if that's the amount of space that's devoted to it, we should sit up and take note what he has to say. The book of Proverbs falls into a genre of literature within the Bible called the wisdom literature. So we're going to consider what does it mean to approach money with wisdom, with the wisdom of God. Now, the first half of this verse in Proverbs 18, verse 10 is one that we're fairly familiar with. We don't always quote the second part of the verse, but it gives us a helpful comparison between the path of wisdom that Proverbs talks about and the path of foolishness. The righteous run to the Lord and find him a strong tower. This is a different version to the one that you might have. I think it helps us to have different flavors of this. Whereas the, the rich rely on wealth, imagining this is a strong city wall that will protect them. Or you've got the version on the screen. The name of the Lord is this strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. The rich think of their wealth as a strong defense. They imagine it to be a high wall of safety. Let's get one thing straight. The Bible teaches that money in and of itself is a good thing. Typically, you can just assume, well, money is bad, but money is good. It's the blessing of the Lord that makes a person rich in Proverbs 10.22. Diligent hands bring wealth in Proverbs 10.4b. It's one of God's good gifts. It's seen consistently as a blessing from God. So Proverbs is very positive about money in and of itself. It's a great servant and a terrible master. Greed is portrayed as this cancer that eats away at the soul. Now, when I consider, if you think about the Ten Commandments, the tenth one, I think, is particularly challenging. Here it is. You shall not covet your neighbor, neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, I don't find it too difficult to avoid murdering. The sixth commandment, not a big deal for me. Although teaching some children can be challenging. <laughs> Survive so far. I also don't normally find myself in front of a shop window considering smashing the glass and making a quick getaway with the jewellery, no matter how smart the watches may look. But not being jealous of what somebody else has is another matter entirely. Now, I've never looked at somebody's ox and thought, oh, I could do with one of those. But when you begin to think of the lifestyle that your neighbor has, that even a member of your family has, somebody that might not even give God a second thought, and they're just in a whole other category of wealth than you, God, why can't I earn the same as them? Why can't I have their house, their car, their lifestyle, their holidays, their clothes, their phone? If only I had... Insert your own materialistic fantasy there. I would be satisfied. That is a lie that comes straight from the pit of hell. If only I had this, and then I'll want this, and this, and this. Money is good in its proper place. But the Bible consistently teaches that money can distract us from what is the best. We have this sad character in the New Testament of this guy who is described as a rich young ruler. And he comes to Jesus full of confidence in his own righteousness and self-sufficiency because his wealth and power in conservative Jewish theology is just showing how much God is blessing him. God is pleased with him and therefore he's got this lifestyle. And he ends up walking away from Jesus sad because Jesus challenges him to give up his idol in order to truly please God. And Jesus concludes, I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. C.S. Lewis helps us here. 
says this, one of the dangers of having a lot of money is that you may be quite satisfied with the kinds of happiness money can give. And so fail to realise your need for God. If everything seems to come simply by signing cheques, you may forget that you are at every moment totally dependent on God. Now this morning, you might be arriving thinking, well, rich just doesn't describe me. I'm not in that category, so this doesn't apply to me whatsoever. What does it mean to be rich? When my idea of riches was being formed, probably around the age of seven, I used to watch this character, this Disney character, Scrooge McDuck, who would dive into his money and swim through it. That's the picture of wealth, that you can swim through the amount that you have. And quite correctly, there are a new number of people in the world, maybe you couldn't swim through it, but have got a fair amount of money. Apparently, the richest 1% of people on the planet own almost half of the wealth on the planet. And if we take the top 26, they have a total of $2.87 trillion. To put that in context, that is more than the annual gross domestic product of Italy and Brazil and Canada and Russia and Mexico and Australia and Spain, owned by 26 people. We've got a problem in our world, in a world that values a footballer's skills this highly and a nurse's skills down here in terms of the money that they are given. We don't have a good, wise approach to money. But it's very easy to sit and, in judgment on those 26 and say, oh, those are bad, bad, evil people. That's who Jesus was talking about when he was condemning people who are rich, saying they're not on the way to heaven. Um, I was listening to something recently that said, if you want to be in the top 1% of earners in the whole world, you only have to earn over £30,000 a year to be in the top 1%. So comparatively, if you're anywhere near that figure or over that figure, you might not feel particularly wealthy because prices are very high and mortgages are high, etc. But in comparison to brothers and sisters around the world, <coughs> we would be considered well off. Let's think about that for a moment. Some of our brothers and sisters in Christ live in abject poverty. Some primarily because they are followers of Jesus and so they're persecuted and they refuse work, etc. But that's not to say that there aren't people here, and people in Ashton who struggle to afford the basic necessities of life. And I would urge you, if you are in that particular difficulty at this moment that you would speak to one of the church leaders so we can support you through that. But the majority of us aren't wondering where our next meal is coming from or where we're going to spend the night. That means we have a responsibility to support those in the body of Christ whose needs are greater than ours. Proverbs 14.21 teaches this, it is a sin to despise one's neighbour, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. That's why we as a church, when money comes into us, don't just keep it all to ourselves. We support organisations such as Platform 67, Slavic Gospel Association, Good News for Everyone, outreach organisations like Cumbria Christian Youth Camp, United Beach Missions, Blyswood Care, who are here this evening, Sports Reach and others, because we want to model what good stewardship of money looks like to the fellowship. Most of us will be familiar with uh, Paul's warning to his young protege, Timothy. <coughs> the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. But we rarely continue to quote the rest of the verse. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's a serious thing to follow the love of money. Jesus puts it like this. You can't serve God and money. Each of us must make a choice. <clears throat> but what does it mean to love money? What does it look like? Alistair Begg 
wrote a helpful book called Made for His Pleasure, and he outlined the following eight things. I am guilty of money, uh, loving money, when thoughts of money consume my day. Other success makes me jealous. I define success in terms of what I have rather than what I am in Christ. My family is neglected in my pursuit of money. I close my eyes to the genuine needs of others. I'm living in paralyzing fear of losing it. I'm prepared to borrow myself into bondage, debt. And I think the, the last one is the one that really struck me. God gets my leftovers rather than my first fruits. Now, different signs on there might resonate with different people this morning. But if you know that one of those things is a particular issue for you, then don't ignore the prompting of the Spirit. Speak to someone. Make a change. Believe me, this has been incredibly challenging looking at some of these principles. We need to understand that work is good but work is not God. We're designed to work. We should expect to use the skills that God has given us to earn a fair wage if we are able. And we should work diligently as if we're working for God himself. In Colossians 3.17, Paul teaches, whatever you do in work or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Work is good. But striking the right balance is vital. We normally think as laziness of, as the biggest sin here, but so is being obsessed with work. Laziness leads us to be reliant on the charity of others, but being a workaholic that doesn't rest leads us to be self-reliant. Under which end of the spectrum you tend towards... There's a happy medium of wise diligence that's outlined in Proverbs. Lazy hands make for poverty. Diligent hands bring wealth. Those who work their land will have abundant food. Those who chase fantasies have no sense. The third one, all hard work brings a profit. Mere talk leads only to poverty. Work is also good because it means we can be in a position to give. And Proverbs teaches that generosity leads to blessing. I was recently listening to a video of a Christian who was dying of cancer. And he spoke about how during his young life, they had been really struggling for money. And when he eventually got a job that allowed him to have a lavish lifestyle, that's exactly what he did. He made sure that the car was upgraded, the house was upgraded. Everything got bigger and better, like the guy building barns, bigger and bigger. And then he stopped and reevaluated his approach to his money. So rather than the constant upgrades, him and his wife decided to be content at a certain level of lifestyle. And then anything in addition to that went into a totally separate giving pot that would all be used to advance the kingdom of God. And they gave away over the course of many years thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds to projects all around the world, including linked to Bible translation, paying for Christian workers around the world, orphanages, etc. And I was challenged when he spoke about the surpassing joy that he and his wife experienced when they gave their money away instead of spending it all on themselves. And one comment that uh, really struck me. He said, you can't outgive God. Proverbs 22, 9 says, the generous will themselves be blessed. Proverbs eleven twenty five says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be blessed. Refresh. This man, like so many before him, proved the word of God to be true. And a short time after the video was filmed, 
he died. I believe he was greeted with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. True faith always leads to sacrifice. We're about to embark on the most expensive building project that we've ever attempted as a church fellowship. And our goal is to invest in a church building that will outlive us. This is exactly what a group of Christians did in 1882 when this church was built as Cain Brown Protestant Institute, as it had the catchy name of. And they invested their money in land and bricks and mortar that would still be serving the people of Ashton 140 years later. When they started the project, they didn't have the money, but they began to build anyway. They believed that the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine was on their side, and they stepped out in faith, trusting that their <coughs> heavenly Father was able to meet their every need. We need that same faith and courage and vision and sacrificial spirit that has been shown throughout the changes to this building. In the 1960s, when we became K. Brown Evangelical Church, and we were still having toilets outside, dark days. We've done everything possible to extend and fix and repair, and we're so grateful for those who do that and put the building back together as best they possibly can. But Proverbs 13, 22 says this, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. We want to build a church for our great-grandchildren to worship in. For a generation that doesn't exist to come and to know Jesus. Proverbs 3.27 instructs us, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. You might not think this morning you've got the power to contribute something that would even put a dent in the overall cost of a new building. But that reminds me of the story of the widow who Jesus commended for her generosity as she gave everything that she had to God. And I'm grateful for the generous widows out there. We need a fresh vision of our Heavenly Father's generosity towards us. Instead of being like the Pharisees, the religious types, who Jesus really criticized, careful to tithe everything, so give 10% of everything, even the herbs grown in their gardens. Jesus encourages us to be generous, as our Heavenly Father has been so abundantly generous to us. Whether you consider yourself to be relatively rich or relatively poor, the parable of the talents encourages us to be diligent with whatever God has entrusted us with. Those who have been given more will be required to give an account of what they did with it. Imagine standing on the day of judgment before the Lord of all, showing him your portfolio of stocks and shares, <coughs> giving him a detailed itinerary of the cruises that you've been on. Wonder what's the first thought that goes through your head when you get a pay rise, or get that promotion, or get an uplift in your pension? Is the first thought, new car? Awesome. new house or is it should I review how much I give to what God is doing right here or around the world you want to chat through how you steward your money well perhaps you could have a, a sit down chat with Eddie the treasurer or any of us just, just to talk practically about how we use our money this morning, Jesus still says, follow me. Follow my example. Follow how I lived. And the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew, this is Matthew 25, 34 onwards, it stops the best of us in our tracks. And it causes us to think carefully how we've treated those who are in need. And in the story, he pictures the whole of the human race standing before the judgment throne and all humans are split into two groups, the righteous and the unrighteous, those who are blessed and those who are cursed. And it 
says this. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. <coughs> then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these you did not do for me. And they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous <coughs> to eternal life. What we do with our money is a reflection of our heart. And I'm so thankful this morning that we are saved by God's grace and not by our works. But the hallmark of any true disciple of Jesus is that we follow him and become increasingly like him. And he's the model for the Christian life. The song we're going to sing finally talks about Jesus as the one who was rich beyond all splendor. All for love's sake became poor. Exchanging his throne for a manger. His sapphire paved courts for stable floor. Stooping so low but sinners raising. As not only does he go to a manger but he goes to a cross. The road marked out for the disciple of Jesus is cross-shaped. It involves <coughs> sacrifice. He doesn't want 10% of your time and attention and energy and money and talents and love and worship. He wants everything. He deserves everything. One final proverb to share with you. I think this is a prayer that we would live in the Goldilocks zone, not too rich and not too poor. It says this, it's from Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise and thank you this morning that you were willing to become poor for our sake. Forgive us when we cling on to our material wealth and don't follow your example of generosity. Help us learn from the wisdom found in Proverbs and throughout the rest of your word to have a good relationship with money. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world living in poverty. We thank you for Christian charities who are working to provide food and shelter, medical care, giving support, but also dealing with spiritual needs. Help us as individuals and as a church to be wise and generous in the way we treat the money you've blessed us with. Holy Spirit, we desperately need your help in this area. Melt our cold hearts, we beg you. We seek to partner with you to continue building your kingdom in Ashton and Makerfield. So we pray that you would grow our faith through this building project. Give us the boldness and the courage we need and make us more like Jesus as a result and may many souls be saved. We ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.